everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to the Ancient Health Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney, and today we're doing a little mini episode rundown, and our subject matter is ADD and ADHD. I imagine that you know somebody probably very close to you, whether it's a child or a spouse or a sibling. I have a sibling that claims she has ADD. <laughs> I'm not trying to diminish her diagnosis, but I think she self-diagnosed herself. So here's the thing. ADD is so common. We see it in so many children these days, but I don't know that there's a lot of conversation around why we're seeing it, why the prevalence of ADD and ADHD is really occurring a lot more now today than it ever has before, and how we help the body heal from this. It's really more of a prescription band-aid kind of diagnosis, and there's really not any testing around it that doctors are doing specifically in the conventional model to look at root cause or why this is originating in children to begin with. So the National Institute of Mental Health classifies or describes this as an ongoing pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity and impulsivity that it interferes with the functioning and development of the individual. Now, like I said, it's most commonly diagnosed in children, but what we see is that two thirds of children or teens or young adults that are diagnosed with this carry this, this condition or this specific uh, set of symptoms into adulthood. So it's really not ever anything that seems to one, either go away or something that conventional medicine can right the ship and heal. So this is really interesting in terms of statistics. So like I said, if you think back decade ago, 20 years ago, this was not as prevalent. So according to the CDC, the number of cases of ADHD has increased by 43% just between the years 2003 and 2011. So they also say that about 15% of US children have a developmental disability. And research shows that the numbers are growing. We can see that they're growing. I mean, 43% in the early 2000s is a massive jump. The other thing that we can correlate with that, and this is where I wanna take this conversation, is what else has changed that could be contributing to that? And the one thing we know is changing is our exposure to environmental toxins. We see that over 250 pounds of chemical toxins are brought into the US every single day per person. That's an astronomical amount of chemical compounds. And the thing is, they don't just, they don't just disappear. They don't evaporate, they don't vaporize. Many of them never break down. These are called forever chemicals. We've talked about that on other episodes. So it's really important to correlate this toxicity piece with this prevalence and surge of cases or surge of prevalence in this specific disorder. Now, what I want to talk about are some comorbidities because oftentimes what we see with children is that children with ADD or ADHD are also susceptible to other things like being on the spectrum of autism, other types of mood disorders. They can a lot of times uh, in early adulthood or late adulthood, you can see substance abuse disorders develop. And the other interesting piece here is that the predictability or chances of diabetes doubles your risk. So if you're diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, you have you are twice as likely to develop diabetes down the road. This is really important because if you're diagnosed at an early age and you are now set up to have a higher proclivity for other diseases, if this isn't something we start to heal and reverse or at least establish why maybe you're experiencing this, it can lead to further problems down the road. Now, I want to shift gears and quickly talk about what has been studied that we've actually found to be correlated as a root cause or potential driver of ADD and ADHD. And there are three contaminants. And I talked about how environmental contaminants are the biggest issue, but there are three that have been studied that have known correlations, and those are lead, phthalates, and BPA. Now, lead is, we commonly know lead as being in lead-based paints. There's also, there have been several people that have talked about and really exposed the data and published studies on lead that's been found in women's lipstick. Um, but lead has been found in our water supply. It's more prevalent than we think. A lot of times we just think lead is in the old things that were dated back in the 70s when they were used in certain building materials. But there are still traces of lead that are in our environment today that we're getting exposed to. And we know that lead, lead is actually the one, um, the one component that actually has the heaviest data supporting its correlation to ADD. Now, the other two are phthalates, which are 
plasticizers, essentially. And if you think of cosmetics, you think of many things you're bringing into your home, they're likely going to have phthalates if they're not sourced really well. So anything that is a cleaning item or something you're maybe putting on your face or nail polish, anything that has fragrance, it likely has phthalates. Plastics have phthalates. Anything that you're, even your baby toys and more recently, we've even found that our clothes have phthalates. They have these plasticizers in them. They're estrogen mimickers. They're endocrine disruptors. They're, they are massively disruptive to the entire hormone system. So phthalates are a real problem. And we also know that phthalate exposure has gone up substantially in the last 20 years. They even did a study on women. So these are moms and the moms that were found to have the highest level of phthalates in their bodies had babies with a lower IQ of almost seven points. So we know that it has a correlation to brain health and brain development. I know, you know, many of you follow a lot of different studies that are floating around and a few of them have really brought to the surface the toxins that have been found in umbilical cords. So they've actually tested toxins in umbilical cords and they're saying that babies are born with over 180 different chemicals and known contaminants, known toxins already in their bodies. So that's something that is concerning right out of the gate is that these young babies are already absorbing exposures that mom has been exposed to. And so there's been talk about breastfeeding and what that looks like in terms of, you know, mom's exposure carrying over to baby. I think breastfeeding is always the way to go. But again, it's not just baby's exposure. Baby's getting these exposures in utero. Baby's getting exposed to them before they even come out of the womb. And it's setting them up for failure because their bodies are so heavily burdened in those early, early phases, embryonic development, and then post-birth. Those are the most critical. And when you start adding in other things like specific vaccinations and, and um, medical procedures early on, you're just doubling down on all of the things that their tiny developing bodies are having to navigate. And those toxic exposures can hijack so many different processes in their bodies that can ultimately create disease from an early, early age, and it can stunt the development neurologically. And that's why we see so many kids that have speech delays and tics. We'll talk about some of these things because they're all connected, ADD and ADHD. It's one facet of it, but oftentimes the kids with ADD, you'll see they'll have mood disorders, they'll have tics, they'll have other behavioral things that are going on. And if it's not addressed early or we're not helping the body start to detoxify and understand how that's how that's really um, impacting their health, then they're going to find themselves with a world of trouble by the time they're in their early teens. And that's the last place as a teenager. I mean, if I remember being a teenager and it's bad enough going through puberty, but going through puberty when your hormones are completely sideways and you're feeling terrible and then you're dealing with anxiety or depression and insomnia and food sensitivities and weight gain, all these other things that are contributed to toxic burden, toxin overload. I mean, that is a rough set of years and you really don't want to go into your early adult life and coming out of that dark season. Now, the problem with diagnosing ADD and ADHD is that the conventional medical system doesn't test for toxins. And I think toxins are really the root cause. Toxins really seem to be the one thing that is the catalyst for this. And if we're not testing it, then we're just medicating it. We're medicating the symptoms and we're never addressing the toxicity. And the toxicity is not just going to have the result of ADD. It's going to create all kinds of problems. Like I said, it will inflame your brain. It will disrupt your gut. Your nervous system is going to be out of balance. It will have massive catastrophic like domino effect type symptoms for the rest of your life if you can't address the drainage and the toxicity and your body being able to methylate well and remove the toxins from your body. So we're not even from the start testing well for it. The other thing is that many times doctors are not looking at nutrient deficiencies and we've correlated and studied specific nutrients in relation as as therapies in relation to mood disorders, specifically ADHD. So children with ADHD 
many of them, about 78%, that's huge, have been found to be deficient in vitamin D compared to 48% of children without ADHD. So vitamin D is so critical for health, especially immune health and bone building and so many other processes. And if 80% of these children are deficient in that, that's going to be an issue. A few other nutrients that we want to look at here are omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Comes as no surprise that living in this modern world, that we would be deficient in healthy fats. I think many diets, especially for a child, they're not getting rich sources of animal fats. A lot of times they're eating processed foods and sugary foods, and they're getting oils and fats, but they're hydrogenated, they're processed, they're refined. They have a high level of oxidative damage on the body, and they're, many of them are PUFAs, so they're just very inflammatory oils. They're not getting the fish oils and the 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 oils that are coming from uh, more natural and animal related sources, or even having like eggs, they're not getting some of these nutrients from whole food sources. So the, the study of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, um, they've so shown market improvement by just bringing that in. Now the caveat is here that you wanna get something that's really good because a lot of omega-3 supplements or fish oil supplements, that's maybe what you're more familiar with in terms of terminology, but a good omega-3 is likely gonna be in the form of a fish oil, and there's a lot of crappy fish oil on the market. Fish oil can be very rancid, very denatured, the processing, the sourcing of it is really, really important. So my rule of thumb would be just don't go to Walgreens, don't go to a drugstore, just buying something off Amazon that's cheap. If you're gonna get a fish oil, you wanna get something that's really high quality, you wanna get something that is a good balance of omega-3 to omega-6, there are several different companies and brands that you can get some of these from, but just make sure you're sourcing something that's really good. Now, magnesium is also, magnesium is a mineral and it's so important, right? We talk about magnesium a lot of times in, in reference to sleep, but if you think about it, if magnesium helps you sleep at night. Magnesium would also likely help you calm down. It would calm the nervous system. So magnesium is so great for children or adults that can't seem to wind down or feel like they're coming out of their skin or feel like they're just fidgeting and agitated, right? It's a very calming mineral to the body. So if you can't take it internally, I have found that it can be really helpful to give magnesium salt baths or use a topical magnesium oil spray or a magnesium lotion because Absorbing magnesium transdermally is actually highly effective and bioavailable for the body. So if you're using it on a child, sometimes that's easier than trying to get them to take it in pill or capsule form. So magnesium glycinate is one of my favorite, but there's so many forms of magnesium. And I think getting a blend of those different forms is great, but also looking at topical applications can be very helpful, especially if you're using it on a child. The last nutrient I wanna bring up here is zinc. Now, a study from 2011 showed that when 30 milligrams of zinc was added alongside stimulant medication, now this is for ADD, the dosage of medication was able to be reduced by 37%. That's remarkable. So that's just zinc by itself without any of the other nutrients. So adding in some things that are really supportive to the body, that the body needs to be able to help create hormone, like zinc is used to help create dopamine. Dopamine is a feel-good hormone. So naturally, we would want to support the building of hormone in the body that is going to help mellow out. It's gonna bring balance to the child. So adding one nutrient is great, but what I would do, this is just my mom brain, is maybe start bringing in small dosage of all of these, magnesium, zinc, maybe some omega-3s, and even a little bit, and if you get a really good, like a cod liver oil or something, it's gonna have a naturally occurring source of vitamin D, which I really like to use something that's more natural. It's in the actual supplement instead of just the nutrient itself. So doing something like that, you may be able to see dramatic changes in your child's behavior. Or, you know, if you're an adult, I would utilize these same recommendations. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be trying these things if it's something that you're affected with, whether you're five years old or you're 35 years old. And now the last thing I want to talk about here are genetics. Genetics always play a role, but epigenetics, which is really the lifestyle component, it's what turns genes on, upregulating genes or downregulating genes. Dr. Ben Lynch has a great book called Dirty Genes. And so he talks about genes being dirty or cleaning your genes. And so your lifestyle, like nutrition and the things you're exposed to and how well you're sleeping and really just the overall habits of your day-to-day -day have a massive influence 
on what those genes do, how they are activated. Now, we know that methylation is a process that really it's it's kind of a series of processes that happen in the body that involve genes so when those genes get turned on certain methyl groups get activated and that the process of methylation occurs but when we have genes that have variants or we have genes that are dirty because of certain lifestyle factors we can't methylate very well and they have found that those with ADD and ADHD can oftentimes be poor methylators. And the two genes that are most commonly discussed in this arena are MTHFR and COMT. So those are genes that might be worth looking into. Now, I think that if you're somebody that's curious at looking into the root cause of this, maybe working with somebody that can do a full genetic report on you, it would just be a blood test. And I know My Happy Genes is a great place to do that. Obviously, we'd want to work with somebody, but what that can do is help help you realize the hardware that you're working with, and then you can be really selective with the nutrient therapy that you're doing because you may see that, hey, some of my genes are a little bit broken, meaning I don't methylate certain vitamins well. I don't utilize, I don't make certain enzymes. So you can actually bring in very strategic support for your body knowing that your body may have a proclivity to work at a certain capacity it just doesn't have the same ability it may be at 40 percent instead of 100 percent or 70 percent and so i think that's always really helpful to know because you can just dial in the variables that you have control over so if you're looking for ways to support your body you can nutritionally support i think across the board getting a good omega-3 fatty acid supplement is really helpful i think bringing in some magnesium most people are magnesium deficient. I would be bringing in magnesium. I would look at, you know, bringing in maybe some additional vitamin D if necessary. Again, you may be able to get a really good fish oil or cod liver oil that has some naturally occurring vitamin D. So that may suffice. And then zinc. So zinc, again, 30 milligrams of zinc can go a really long way and see if those don't move the needle. You can also do other testing. You can do some um, micronutrient testing, organic acids testing. I think those are incredibly helpful for a caregiver that's trying to help a child navigate so that they can actually go through their childhood and you're not just fighting behavioral issues because it may be their physiology that's the barrier. Like They may really not be able to control a lot of things and medicating you know, may have a time and a place at some point, but if we don't ever look beyond that, then we're just kicking the can, you know, down the road and we're gonna have to deal with it at some point. Then you're an adult and you're still on this medication trying to work your job. Now your body's even more depleted and you've got a whole host of other problems. You're inflamed, maybe you've got autoimmune issues, you've got, you know, your nervous system is completely out of whack. And then you're you're really up to bat against so many different things. So it's really important that you do the legwork to understand maybe where some of this is rooted. There's always resources. There are always solutions, in my opinion, to help support the body, no matter what condition that you have. Now, a couple of resources I thought I would mention, and these are just things that I found along the way when I was researching this stuff, is the Healthy Children Project. If you have a child with ADD or ADHD, this is a great resource. They have great videos, they have articles, a lot that will deepen your understanding of the why behind this or the possibilities of why there's never just one blanket answer it's a lot of different things but you'll start to see the overlap between them and you may be able to figure out maybe this is where my child fits in and this might be the best approach to help them so the healthy children project is a place you could go and access some resources the other thing is just another company that i really like called bioray because like i said in the beginning a lot of this has to do with toxins I think that the majority of issues that most people are facing today, whether you're young or old, anywhere in between, is our exposure to environmental toxins. Our disease rates have gone through the roof, as have our exposures increased over the decades. And we're now, our bodies are, are piling up so much stress by way of exposures, whether it's mental stress, all of these different things, they're creating toxicity and they're jamming up all of our processes that help us feel good, that help us do the things that we wanna do, that help us sleep well, that help us recover. And so we stay inflamed and we stay tired and our brains are slow. And it's a lot in part due to toxic exposure. So to me, you've gotta do some work to help detox your body. You've gotta help. Castor oil packs are so amazing for kids. I think that they're they're great for adults. I love doing castor oil packs, but I love using them on kids. They actually think it's kind of fun. It's a little bit, it can be a little messy if your kids try to get like super involved and, you know, and they're ripping it off and everything. But you know what? It's so effective. It's so safe. 
and it works. I mean, it, it works and it's very, it's a very easy therapy to include. And it's, you know, it's not expensive. So Queen of the Thrones, my friend Marisol is incredible. Um, Dr. Marisol, and I'll link her stuff here in the show notes, but she has castor oil packs for kids. I think that's a great one. Um, BioRay is also another great company. They have uh, little tinctures. So these are oral drops that you just give to your kids. And again, something that is a blend of different herbs that helps support the brain, support detoxification, the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, and they're very nourishing for kids, very safe. Um, but again, helping them gently support some of those detoxification protocols. I've seen my own kids their mood has changed dramatically just from doing a couple of those things by having them do some extra uh, minerals by having them do some baths by doing some castor oil packs they go from being edgy little tyrants to totally normal and sweet-hearted children and i think there is my little angel that i remember but honestly the toxins the gut infections the inflammation their bodies are so sensitive when they're young and it's get it gets expressed a lot of times in their mood and their behaviors and their actions they do not regulate very well and so they can go from zero to 60. so if you're struggling with that with a child maybe try bringing some of those in see if it supports try them at different times and maybe even work with a practitioner or do some additional testing i think that may give you a little bit more of a handle on next steps so that you don't get overwhelmed hopefully this conversation was not boring. It's kind of a quick little overview of ADD and ADHD, but maybe it got you thinking about it in a different way. I kind of feel like this subject is similar to IBS. It's like if any child has a behavior issue or they're just, they're not paying attention, it's like, well, they have ADD, you know, and it's the same thing with IBS. Like, well, well, I'm constipated or my stomach hurts and I can't eat these foods. Well, you have IBS. It's kind of a blanket statement and nobody really digs any deeper. And I think that it is really valuable to start looking at every single thing that the body is giving as feedback and to take that into consideration when you're making your choices day to day, whether it's your supplements, whether it's just your routine, it's what you're thinking about, it's how you treat your body every hour of the day that's really gonna dictate the outcome of what you get to experience in your body. So with that, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Share this episode, like it, send me a DM. Love to connect with you guys and I will see you on the next episode.